Hello, welcome back to the David Watson podcast. As always, thank you for subscribing and listening. Your support is always appreciated. And today I was able to speak with Amy Pollock, the author of Jelly Bean. Fascinating insight into yeah, the life of a teacher and the stories that she learned from her own childhood that followed her to being a grandmother. And we talk about the writing process, Jelly Bean as a character. Yeah. We meander for a few stories along the way. I hope you enjoy this episode as much as I did. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good morning. Welcome to the David Watson podcast. And thank you very much for joining me from New York. How are you? Hi, David. Nice to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much. And just for reference, I've, you and I have just had a little chat about the size of New York compared to the UK, which I seem to talk to about every time I talk to somebody who says New York. Um just to find out a little bit geographically um and just on a little side note because it's a favorite little topic of mine you have a dog don't you mm -hmm. could you just give me a little information yes about the dog? we I've seen do it in your bio. She... Mm -hmm. are do you have one are you i do i have a little staffordshire or... called molly who's a rescue dog ours is a rescue oh no nice. we only get rescues and my husband's a huge dog lover so this is more the yeah, our other dogs were always much more much friendlier towards me this one loves him to pieces and kind of protects him from me which is a joke but and then she's a fussy eater so he makes all sorts of meals for her so where do i so you saw my dog in my in my jelly bean stories is a pretty inter integral part of it she well, loves her dog. Uh, yeah, so so it's just you know, could it's that, and, and just because I have a dog, and uh, I always like to ask people, you know, if they've got a dog, just just you know, what what is your dog, and how did you come across across the dog? And, you know, it's it's always I a good icebreaker. It. Yeah, it's, it, uh, it's just I know. It's, it's a useful icebreaker. Right, I just... You know what? When I first saw, I didn't grow up with a dog, which is interesting because we've always had dogs for many years now. And when I we went over a friend of mine's house, and when I saw her little boys running around in the yard with their big, beautiful collie, I said, okay, that's it. We have to get one. And my husband knew just how hard it is when your dog goes. And first he resisted, and I said, no, we have to. Have to get one. We did. You know, that's a dilemma every time with a dog, because like you say, that they bring oh. so much joy. But when you lose one. Oh. It's so hard, but and this is going to sound know. strange, but if you're lucky, you start to pine for one again. I know that is the truth because I've vowed so many times this is our last dog, we're not getting another. We always did, so yeah, <laughs> so true. Yeah, it's one of those things, they are they're so loyal and they're so forgiving, and no matter what you do, they come back to you. and that's what happens in my book and a lot of people in my jelly bean books they just love that part of it which is so interesting to me cuz i didn't i didn't originally begin with that being such a major part of it but it has become that there is someone that'll always always be available to her always listen to her always comfort her that's how it is yeah 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 Dogs are just fantastic like that there's something about them i know yeah. i know our and, furry and for, friends. Yeah, yeah, but and for people that have them, nothing else can pass. I know. Like my daughter has they have cats and I, I don't know. To me, they love them, but it's not the same. Well, especially because I'm allergic. But anyway. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They love the cats. The cats are like, eh, humans. Uh, who cares? I know. Uh, exactly. Yeah, that's funny. My mom always said that, and that is the truth. Whereas dogs have a different relationship to you, they do. Yeah, yeah. The dogs, dogs genuinely adore you with I all know. their heart. They're just an open heart, and and they love you. Oh, for I know. It. You know. You know yeah, that that is the truth. So that's my little indulgence on finding out about your dog. Um, <laughs> that's okay. Fine. <laughs> so yeah, tell everybody about your book and Jelly Bean. So my jelly bean book, which I was just writing a blurb to someone yesterday at another library where I'm going to be, 
So in my adventures of Jelly Bean, someone just, one of my really, I've gotten these great reviews, described her as a role model, which was so, I mean, I was happy, but it was so funny to me because that was not, not an original intention of mine either. But she, she's a forthright fourth grader. And I think this is why a lot of adults like my stories also. She learns throughout her adventures in my book one and book two, and I just sent my three off to a publisher oh, who happens to be in England, actually, uh, Pegasus. But anyway, she uh, learns by trial and error, like most of us, to make wise decisions. And uh, she has a lot of ups and downs with her. She's the youngest of four children in her family, and she's the only girl. And a lot of times she feels like she's not listened to as much as the others. And that is similar to my daughter who had two older brothers. And it's also based on a cousin of my husband's who had three older brothers. She was the only girl also. And since I'm the oldest in my family, I guess it was interesting for me to see, and I've often sided with the underdog, and she learns to she learns to become feisty and to do what she thinks is right, whether or not others agree with her, including her parents and other classmates and friends. And a lot of, when I speak at a lot of the schools, they all are nodding you know, it's tough, the whole issues of popularity and, and what, and also activities that you decide to do or not want to do or that your parents want you to do or children they want you to be with as opposed to those you prefer. So she goes through a lot of those kind of dilemmas and um, my books are the result. Where does the name Jelly Bean come from? So what happened was, this is sort of funny, but back when I was in fourth grade, now today is actually my birthday and Happy I'm birthday. 71, but <laughs> thanks. So I'm talking about 60 years ago when I was in fourth grade, uh, maybe a little bit more. But anyway, my teacher would have me come up to the front of the room whenever she had downtime before vacation, when the lesson was over, whatever. Things were a little bit different then. And I would tell these stories to the class, which honestly, David, people remember who were in my fourth grade class, which I, I was pleasantly surprised. And they were about this little girl named Jelly Bean and her adventures. And she was mischievous back then, which everyone loves. You know, it's always more fascinating than a goody two-shoes. And I would, like, why would everyone be so fascinated by King Henry VIII, right? As opposed yeah. to some of the other rulers. <laughs> so it's just one of those things. So um, so I would tell these stories off the top of my head. Plenty of things I can't do very well, but I do have a vivid imagination. And I would just tell these stories, and the class loved them. And she was just always named Jelly Bean. And I can't even tell you how that originated, because... That's one of those things adding to the list of things I just don't remember. But that it just stuck. Her real name's Jillian. It's a nickname, so yeah. but her real name's Jillian Beth. The the funny thing is 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 some sometimes the best things are what we don't remember. And it's normally or most likely because it you probably just come up with it on the spot. Hmm. Yeah, true. Yes. That is exactly true. So, yeah, I could rack my brain, but that part I don't remember. But she was always lovable and maddening and just like our kids are, uh, all rolled into one. And how she um, manages, well, she can, in the books I wrote subsequently, because the stories obviously originated a long time ago, and I would work on them here and there. And through the years, and I had to change many things, such as technology and uh, names, because the names that were popular when I was in fourth grade, 
Kathy, Susan, Barbara, yeah. Debbie. They're just not as popular now. So I, ch I changed a lot of those. And also, I had to go through all my stories over the years and change the phone rang in the house. It doesn't really happen. Everyone has their own phones. And they're always... So it's a good uh, point. Kids yeah. Are, that's, that's a good point. You know, including my own grandchildren, they're always on their tablets. And that's kind of how it is now. And so I had to change a lot of that through the years. And... Um, yeah, my story's kind of more... Oh, and my silver lining, don't laugh, was the horrible pandemic because we were stuck at home for the most part for several months. My daughter would say to me, what? You can't come babysit? And I'd say, well, it's just not permissible right now. I had to sit down, either finish my books and send it off to publishers or, you know, clean out my closets, which was not as attractive no, so that's how that and jelly bean had a better flavor for something to do <laughs> yes so to say mm -hmm. although it's hard to sit yourself down i always talk about procrastination when i go to the schools so, and the groups talk about it now oh it's so relatable i will find i mean when people say what's the hardest part about writing your stories sitting down and getting myself to do it other than finding everything else in the world that quote unquote needs to be done you know and then it'll get to 10 30 11 o'clock at night and i'm like oh yeah i had meant to write some more of my story and that's ridiculous and um having taught for 40 years um i couldn't do that not with my take-home you know correcting because teaching english is a lot of especially when I taught at the college level, you know, you got to get going on that and you know, it would take forever and ever and ever. Um, but now with this being self-directed, let's say, yeah, it's the procrastination business is a little trickier when you don't have like a set deadline, except the so that's my procrastination story. It's interesting, isn't it? Because there's this deep desire to do something. That there's something you desperately want to do that you then keep pushing and pushing. Mm -hmm. It's almost like the if there was some way you could magically um, be given your deepest love. I and know. Just as you're on the... That's definitely what I want. That's definitely what I want. You always just keep it at arm's length. Like, I dare not touch it. Like it's Pandora's box. Why is that? I know. I know. You're so right. But then sometimes I'll read about, because I always like love reading the stories of other authors who sit down at 5 a.m. and, you know, just work at what they're doing for four hours each day. And I'm like, oh, my God. I wonder if I could ever accomplish that. I, I don't know. And it depends, you know, how you're wired, which is what makes this world so interesting, because... That doesn't seem to me something I'm readily able to accomplish, but maybe I should make another New Year's resolution. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you have procrastination in any other areas of your life? Oh, hmm. Uh, not so much. Most Mostly this. The rest I do. Uh, my babysitting and exercising. That I keep pretty my babysitting because my kids would be kind of disappointed if i didn't make it there and uh exercising is just something i uh i'm just accustomed to to doing early early in the day unless i have an early speaking engagement yeah. or going to a school something like that so what do you think und lies underneath that procrastination but is it something that you think is resistant to come out or something you dare not let out Mm. Oh, boy, oh, boy. That is a really, that is a tough consideration. It's something I would say, David, that I do work at, but I could be a lot better. I think sometimes it's, oh, I don't want to sound, I don't know if this is part of it, being a perfectionist in something else that I'm doing. Like, oh, I imagine it okay, is. Okay, I have, you know, I need to cl finish cleaning up the kitchen. 
and it has to be just right, which is kind of silly because it'll wait for you, you know. But I think if that's my mother was meticulous about many things, so I think I got that, and that can kind of get in your. It's good and bad, one of those things. Whereas I don't know, growing up, my daughter was such a slob, and I thought, you know, about her room, and a lot of kids are. You know, in a way, she's so lucky because she's not wasting time cleaning up every day, you know, like I yeah. am. So it is really interesting. And That's my true. husband's like that, too. <laughs> it's a good patch. It's a good match. Sorry. It's um, yes, just, so. uh, just want to wind back because you, you said that this started when you were in fourth grade. Just for reference for people in England and the UK, mm -hmm. stuff, what age is fourth grade? Oh, okay, right, because your grades are different. Yes, I, did, I was aware of that. Okay, so for, and a lot of the elementary schools are changing now without getting into a whole thing. Some are just like only fifth grade or only first, kindergarten first and second. But back in the day, which is more more or less the model now. It's kindergarten through fifth, let's say. So I was nine. Well, I was pushed ahead um, because of being gifted, let's say. So um, I was nine in fourth grade. And then middle school where I taught. Well, I also taught fourth and fifth grade back in the day. But middle school which we called junior high then, junior high school then. But now it's middle school. That's for the most part, unless it's changed in some districts, um, is sixth to eighth. I taught in that, those grades. And then high school is ninth to 12th grade. And then, and I've taught in high school also. And after that, if you're college bound, you go to college, which is after that where, where I taught also. And then... I went to graduate school after that, which some people do, some people don't. I went for um, education, and I got some more advanced degrees, all centered around education. I did special ed for the kids with special needs, and yeah, I did that for for a while. I, I'm, I'm trying to get an understanding and build a picture because you, you talked about nine years old being at the front of the classroom, and mm -hmm. this is where Jelly Bean ultimately started that, that that's where it was born mm -hmm. but was jelly bean created there kind of on the spot or were you already kind of having yes. these adventures yes she was created on the spot and then as i said she sort of morphed through these various stages for example when i taught sixth grade the kids, you know, the child's the father of the man, were wonderful. And from the mouths of babes, they uh, would say, oh, Mrs. Pollock, that's stupid. Or, no, you should try this or that. And a lot of times they had some pretty good um, suggestions. Then when I um, had my own children, I would get ideas from them. And... And from their situations and their friends, like Jelly Bean has an anorexic friend. Yeah. And that happens quite a bit. It's fairly commonplace. That's one thing she goes through with helping this. I don't want to do too much of us. <laughs> Spoiler. Um, when she has to choose between being in her gymnastics meet or helping her friend. You can see what happens. Yeah, yeah. Cool. And uh, if you read my <laughs> Adventures of Jelly Bean books. And um, she also changed in the friend that she has that she loves. She's a sweet, loyal, fun, wonderful girl. This happens in a lot of households. Many, many, many. Um, the parents don't prefer her to be Jelly Bean's friend. Let's just say she's from the wrong side of the tracks. Yep. And poor Jill, you know, it's pretty commonplace. And she says to her parents, which happens in many households, but maybe this is why my book is so well liked, because I'm pretty honest. Oh, you just don't like her because she's poor. Mm. That would be said. But I can't make, 
I didn't want to make the mom too much of a monster because she's not meant to be, but it's realistic. And she'll say, well, she can come here, but I don't want you to go there because I don't like certain things about her household. So they're Jelly Bean they're, deals they're with a lot of... genuine parent concerns and fears, aren't they? Yes. But, okay, I know why my Jelly Bean books are kind of popular in this way, because you can see both sides. Yeah. Here she loves this friend. No one's allowed to go over her house. Just she knows it's so sad for her. But at the same point, you see the mom's side point of view. She doesn't yeah. want anything bad to happen to her. So I won't tell you how Jelly Bean resolves that, but I did get the idea from my daughter. Um, I said, what would you do in a case like that if I didn't allow you to do something? Well, read it and see. <laughs> then the grandma, who, of course, I love because I have my seven grandchildren now, she understands the little girl, but she understands the mom also. That's her daughter. So she, you know, it's sort yeah. of her role to kind of try to see all sides and smooth things out, which is really not an easy job. <laughs> no, no, for sure. It's one of the things that um, I wanted to ask you. Do you mind if I ask you where, um, what was, wh wh where were you from, uh, like your parents and stuff? So, my father was from Brooklyn, New York, yep. and um, a lot of people originated from there. And my mom was from Morristown, New Jersey, which was an outlying suburb and no more. But um, back in the day, going there from where we lived in Summit, New Jersey, um, we passed cows and pastures and farms now it's, it's pretty built up yeah so um it was a really beautiful area it was a suburb of newark because that's where my grandparents were from and my other grandma had escaped from russia because a lot of jewish yeah. people had to do that at the time oh quite yeah 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 the reason i ask is how would you explain these books to your parents Oh, that's kind of interesting. <laughs> Since you know, my like parents a, died, a, when a they child were going through anorexia. 60... You know, how, how would you? Sorry, your parents oh, died when they died. While well, my father was sixty and my mother was seventy-seven, uh -huh. and since I really I miss them a lot today yeah, being course. my birthday, and you know all the holidays and all. It's, it's I sort of it it. You lost your parents also? Were they kind of on the no, young side? No, I, I'm. I actually don't speak with my father. To be fair, um, but I deal with my mum. It's just I remember. It's always stood out for me. I remember a conversation with my mum uh, many years mm -hmm. ago because her, her her parents died. My mum's still with me, but her parents died in the eighties. You know, it's like many years ago when we were still. I was still a child, mm -hmm. and she said mm -hmm. that her dad passed first, and then her mum died uh, a few years later. And she said she had a realization after her mum died that she was no longer anyone's child. And that hit her really hard. I know. Yeah. And for it some is. reason, I've always I, remembered I that conversation. Agree with you, more. you know, those would stick in your head. Yeah. You are so right. So I kind of recreate, since I had these wonderful parents and this pretty much idyllic childhood, which. You take for granted at the time because everything that you go through seems like the norm. And I, I know it. So they're recreated in my book and the grandma. I had this grandmother, who, well, both of them, but the one who was so patient and sweet and kind. And the one, and I loved my grandfather as well, but he was the one. And in my books, he's recreated. And you always think this is normal too. He didn't have a lot of patience so, and he was a wonderful loving guy but it was just how he was he would go out in the car and honk until my grandmother got there and be like okay that's grandpa you know you know what I think of it. but I was so love and so I did recreate them in a lot of ways in my books because then to me they're still there because sometimes yep. like you were saying what your mom said you're sort of surrounded by ghosts and that's a terrible feeling and so I have them 
And that's what makes my books kind of, for me, sort of therapeutic. Because I had this dad who, and I took it for granted, where I would go over to a friend's house or someone's house, and the dad was all crabby and cranky, which I got, I understood in later years, they probably had stresses from work and God knows what all else. But my dad was, for the most part, cheerful mm -hmm. and kind and loving and always came up to see what was you know, going on with me, even when I was a teenager and yeah. you, know, you didn't you want your to. parents hanging around <laughs> so much. So they're, they're in there. Because this is, it's uh, something that's a big interest to me um, is does it come through with, with the um, press release that I was sent through. There's a conversation about, you know, your books cover some tough issues, but the, the, there's a simpler time about growing up when you and I grew up pre internet where it was like ball, spud gun, tags, you know. So, like, how would, if you were having that conversation with your parents, if you were able to, oh. to do that, you know, how, how do you explain that this is my childhood, and this is the, ch the childhood of my grandchildren today? Did, but it's a oh. different, an mm. absolute different world. How would you articulate that to them? It's, so different and and i'm almost i miss my parents but i'm almost glad they're not here to see all the strife and uh, killing and misunderstandings and just some of the awful things going on because i would have a tough time talking to them about it um especially my mom because she also tended to um i loved her loved her to pieces but to catastrophize and and it's just not a good idea to do that because there's just you have to keep hopeful you you have i'm just saying it from yeah, then, my yeah. point of view how do you explain to i think it, it was it you said your grandmother uh, fled russia right which, yes which wasn't uncommon you know that's an era of people that fled countries you know very common from all over europe and eastern europe okay how do you explain to them some of the things that children are complaining about today that they think is unfair. Oh, ha, ha, ha. oh boy! Wow. Because in terms of context, it's just as important to them as it was life saving for your grandparents. No, you're you're so right. I, it's such an interesting question. That would be that would be difficult, right? The thing, although my grandchildren are, well, the older ones are pretty aware. You don't want to let them spend too much time in no. front of the news because it's so distressing. But that would be tough to explain because like, for example, my grandfather, the one I, I never got to know, I wish I could have known him. He had escaped from Russia in a pogrom and where both his parents were killed. He had, and this was a story of a lot of many immigrants. He yeah. had come to this country and he didn't know the language. He didn't know anybody. He was penniless and how he became so successful is such a fascinating story. And you're right. The things that they had to deal with and put up with are miles different from, from today. But, yeah, thinking of some of the things and the parties that go on with them, because my oldest granddaughter, she'll share some, not all. But, it, yeah, I would have to say it certainly would be... I don't know that they would total. I think they would try to understand what goes on, but I think it would be pretty tough. Because it's it's it is that thing, isn't it? It's um, and it's a well used phrase that it was a simpler time, not an easier time, but it was okay. a lot simpler. Yes, and a lot of the complications we have today. I'm not sure South There are more made... choices. Yeah. Sorry, you cut out briefly. You said, was it more choices? Because, I mean, when my grandparents had to work, and I remember in my grandmother, while her brother had written, and, uh, oh, many more choices now. Back then, you had to work, and you helped your family. And now that's not always how things are done. They're, and you accepted a lot more. Like I know, and I love my mother-in-law, and she was extremely helpful, but she was extremely critical. And 
I wouldn't dare be like that now with my, I, I'm not tempted with my two daughters-in-law. It wouldn't, it wouldn't fly. Back then, you just accepted it. You, speaking for myself. And also, in my, um, my one grandmother, the one who came from Russia, in her brother's autobiography, it was just a sentence, but it said it all. For years, she, when she came here, she supported him, her younger brother, and her parents. She worked. You, you just did it. You didn't think about it. You didn't question it. So that was like for years. That was her life. I was like, wow. And it wasn't really talked about. No, it, it was normal. It you was just well, that's what did you what did. you had to do. Yeah, and and it's it's just fascinating. Very, you know, it's very fascinating. How how do you explain that to your parents? Like this is where we are today. And by the way, if you were still here. Your great grandchildren would have these things called tablets that they'd spend all day staring at and wouldn't talk to you when you walked in the room. Sorry, I lost you there. I think my uh, interesting. Internet is like, okay, since my parents had made it through the depression, it was such a yeah, it's a little tricky. Yeah, it's a little tough to hear you, but well, I was just going to say, since my parents made it through the depression, through tough times, and if I would go shopping with my mother, she'd be, oh, Amy. And she was really good. She sewed all her own clothes and all that. And they made anything out of leftovers. A delicious meal yeah. out of, you know, things you would just go get a takeout now, to be brutally honest. But she would say to me, oh, Amy, don't buy that. I, I could make you that. That's a scrap of material, you know, some $100 bathing suit. I, I could make that for 90 cents, you know, and I'd be like, mom, but I like this, you know, it was but you wouldn't have you'd sort of be too embarrassed to buy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> come back yeah. some other time. <laughs> it's hard with the generations, but I have that in there in my jelly bean books also because I think it's perennial. Well, because you you said didn't you? It's the the stories that you used to tell as a fourth grader about jelly bean. You've had to adjust through through the years and through the ages, and obviously as a teacher who's gone all the way through the schools right through to college all the way from you know all the way through what is it the 80s mm -hmm. 90s and the noughties is that correct when yes yes you know so you've transitioned many generation uh, generations and many technologies yes I have. I mean, now technology is everything. I mean, I had to learn a lot. It was so funny because this one girl who was extremely woman helpful to me at um at one of the at the high school where I taught, and she's like, "Amy, just try this, try." This. And I was like scared because I wasn't accustomed to it. It wasn't something I grew up with. She's like, "Amy, you're not going to blow up your computer. Go ahead, like try this, try that." And then one of the Old or older, she was older than I was. Teachers, she'd always be like, and the computers weren't so wonderful in those schools. They were sort of covered with bagels and butter and God knows what all else. They weren't clean too much. So she'd be, oh, this is this is broken. I can't do it. And I'd be, no, 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 no. Um, trying to think what her what her first name was. I can't think of it. But I said, and we shared a room. She was my supervisor. No, here, here, here. Look, just try to. And she'd be, you are a genius. And I said, again, <laughs> forgetting her first name, but I said, okay, say that again, because my kids, my own children, they would be laughing so hard if they heard you say I was a genius with the computer, because I'm clearly not. But I had, I had had to learn the basics, you know, for work and sending notes to the parents and so forth. So that was sort of funny that everything yeah. being relative. <laughs> because it is, isn't it? I mean, and also, and if. No, come on, come on. I was just going to say earlier on in my life and when I guess my kids were young, we just played out on the street. That's what we did all the time. And it was wonderful. We played all those games and kickball and spud and tag and dodgeball and so forth. And now they're just on their kids. They're outside for certain organized activities, but they're on their laptops. Anyone will tell you that. Their tablets yeah. a lot. How 
Are there any things that stood out when you started to write the stories that is so different from your own childhood? But there's lots of similarities. Problems are still problems. Okay. Yes, correct. But it, it's interesting you say that because, and I guess I learned some of this from my students, not the college bound ones, but you know, they had a valid existence and her jelly beans, older brother, and some of my own children were rebellious and some of the students, believe me, they put me with some tough kids. Um, and they thought it was inspiring, but some of them did. Uh, her oldest brother does not want to finish high school. Sometimes happens, not in my personal experience, but, her, and the parents are so upset about it because they wanted him to have more opportunities in life. And he goes to join the Marines. Now that did not happen in my own personal experience, but I certainly knew of it in plenty of cases, someone that wanted to go and do something different, but he, her older brother, and I speak about that in a level appropriate for my books for middle grade, meaning for ages seven to 12. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't speak about something in, um, m what should I say, more mature, mature language, but the parents are upset, but this is what he wants to do. And then for Jelly Bean, it's hard because it takes up a lot of their emotional base, let's say. So she feels more left out, but they're they're worried for their son. And this wasn't their top choice for them. But as my dad would say, and I have the father saying this, when you have children, they're hostages to fortune. It was someone famous had said that but so true yeah like you can't after a point you can't cannot force them to do so try as you might they're gonna be with who they want they're gonna marry who they want live where they want you know after a point so I, it's, I think uh, that's probably one of the hardest things about being an adult because you see that with your own siblings children friends that no matter totally. how wise totally. experienced you think people are if, if they get a a desire to do something, no amount of logic or common sense will stop them. You're so right. And, okay, it's kind of interesting, David, because, and my PR person, he's wonderful, had told me to write up, because I had helped a lot of parents with this, especially when I taught high school, 15 tips for raising your <laughs> successful and happy children. I mean, that's always the hope. And... Um, what this isn't even original. I learned it from a book and I don't think it's still in print. And at one point with my son, because one of my sons, because we just were not communicating very well and I didn't like a lot of the things he was up to. I won't go into detail uh, right here, but um, the book taught me a lot. Like if you switch around the letters and this is among my tips yeah. that I hope it's okay. I borrowed from this book written by two women, Lot and Nelson. I'll give them credit because I read all the books at that point. Some were too strict for me. Some were too lenient. This was just right. Just like the three bears, just in the middle. If you turn around the letters of listen, you'll get silent. And sometimes you have to try to beat what's so hard for a parent. <clears throat> like you say, if you have something <clears throat> logical, or that makes sense to you that you want to get across. <clears throat> Sorry, you have to wait till the right moment yeah. and just be quiet and then try to gauge when your child is ready, hopefully, presumably, to listen. And then you have to listen to what they have to say, what's important to them at that particular moment, and then try to then launch into what you want to try to persuade them is a good idea to do it's very hard it's one of the hardest things uh, uh, yeah I, I can imagine i mean i don't have any children but um mm -hmm. I, I coach lots of people <laughs> you know and, oh. and they come to me for help and then still don't want to listen so you, you kind oh. of like, you know and and like you have to somebody will say something you have to gauge when's the appropriate time to bring it back up with them you're so right. And my mom would say that. I'll wait till the right time. Mm. And they'll That's tell me hard, something yeah. like full confessional. You know, they're all, and at the same time, they're asking you 
what do you think and ha how would you deal with this what's your suggestions and you, you and you have to learn to mm -hmm. listen to the tone of what they're saying to know whether or not they really want to hear it mm -hmm. yeah and then other yes. times you have to gauge oh, so, so interesting go on no what i was going to say to you that's exactly right and my daughter who went into the field of um nutritionist dietitian and she would say to me sometimes mom these people they don't want to do what i'm telling like someone who's grossly overweight or yeah. someone who wouldn't eat you know all sorts of food issues and she would say mom sometimes they just want to talk and yeah. i'd say you know what that's helpful too if you just listen it is but, yeah it is it's, it's but it's frustrating if you want to get across something yeah because more often than not and 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 i'd imagine it's a, a theme throughout your book is you're actually trying to communicate a way to people to help them so they can navigate life and some of the lessons in life that you only understand with experience and with age i know that, you know so you, you can't explain how some you know like what what children don't understand in many ways is adults feel vulnerable as well mm -hmm. but we've normally yes. come up with a ton load of negative ways to deal with it and suppress mm -hmm. it bypass it and very few adults until they get to a certain point which is normally a point of no return are forced into <sighs> dealing with something and when they are forced yeah. down that road of dealing with something they come up with all of these epiphanies and you're just like oh yeah and you then try and impart that very level of spiritual awareness for want of a better term on a child that hasn't even experienced that vulnerability yet it's so true and this also happens in my jelly bean books is that some lessons and you hope they're not too damaging you hope they're not too terrible but some lessons that you learn you have to experience for yourself yeah. and like you say you coach and i have my children and i had all so many students you don't want them to have to learn on their own but sometimes that's just how it is it makes you feel bad but it does it does i think the worst thing is when you see somebody who's genuinely in pain because of something that's happened to them in life is the um, is the realization that you can't I, there's nothing i can do to help you because grieving takes time but what was the second part because i said there's there's nothing you can do to help them because grieving takes time yes yes correct well oh, it really 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 does take quite a while and i'm sure you give methods for dealing with it but sometimes you know it's just gonna hit you and yeah i i find yeah, all you can it, really that is do a is, tough is, thing and she yeah. is a yeah I, I was gonna say the only thing i find with grief is Even. all you can do is let is let somebody speak about it and because there's no off switch mm -hmm. in, until you've grieved and it, it's just as um as sad as it is it's a process and and it takes time and just give people space to speak about it and, and that's all you can do really no you're so right and i learned this not that it was a good thing when my father died of this mm. horrible cancer but it did teach me how to respond and to deal with other people going through something similar because by going through which i never would have chosen something like that myself then i learned how to just you know if someone was saying something about someone who was very sick or who had died which i've had a couple friends that have passed away reading one thing about being this age and you do just have to listen and i'm sorry and i i understand and that's sometimes all there is after yeah. a point but you're I right just, well i want to go back to something you said uh towards the beginning of the podcast um because it's, it's 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 kept going around in my head you you were talking about jelly bean is the youngest girl with three older brothers mm -hmm. and you're the oldest with younger brothers is that correct so i have i'm the oldest in my family and i have a younger sister and younger brother and we're all pretty close yeah so, so it's, a, it's an interesting dynamic that you came up with a character that's opposite to you 
Because I know. No, yeah, because normally people have a an an alter ego where they're almost trying to express things they don't want to talk about. So I sometimes when I'm talking to people, if I know something's a bit awkward and, and I don't know how to articulate mm -hmm. it, I will just blatantly mm -hmm. say, I'm sorry about this is gonna sound really clumsy, but and I don't know how to articulate it, so I'm just going to ask it, right? And that mm -hmm. normally gives me a green light to say whatever I want. Oh, interesting. And people Very. do that when they write normally. They'll put in a character and mm. then just write what they want, <laughs> which is really sometimes their inner thinkings. It's great. Yeah, that part is so wonderful, and it's so therapeutic. And it's funny you should say that vis-a-vis. -vis, well, I'm a really avid reader, and right now I'm rereading Middlemarch, and it is funny because I know some of her sentiments were spoken by a lot of the characters, and it is a great way to get that across. So you're so right. But I guess I always, I don't know, had some affinity for the underdog, even though that was not my position in my family constellation. Maybe because I was often the youngest in my class since I had been pushed ahead. I don't know. But yeah. I think a lot was from my daughter and always getting teased by her older brothers. I mean, yeah, because you know, Jelly, a lot of times they Jelly Bean me. came before that, you see. Yes. True, true, true. So, hmm. I'm, I'm trying to join the dots between you as an individual as a fourth grader coming up with a character mm -hmm. who on paper is the opposite of who you were in that respect yes but in other ways um she was me <laughs> sound like a uh, flaubert you know madame bovary she's me you know you don't have to be exactly like your character but um i don't think back then she may have been the youngest and i mean we did and i always led my sister into this kind of thing so many mischievous things. I mean, we had fun. We were feisty back in the day. Like, for example, he's long gone. But in my uncle's office, what we did was, and he was kind of mad, naturally. And she's very close with her uncle in the story, my jelly bean. Because we had this uncle that we loved, and he was an orthodontist. So in his office, among the, do you know what highlights magazines are? The kids' magazine? Maybe it's no. just here. You know, it's a magazine for kids. It's good. It has puzzles, games, stories, so forth. But in there, in the stack of those, in his waiting room, we put some of the Playboys that we had found in his bathroom. <laughs> and he was <laughs> so young at the time, but we just thought it was hilarious. So he's like, okay, girls, uh, you know, when he discovered this, I guess one of the moms had shown. And we did all kinds of crazy things. Like now I'm right. Right. So it's you know, so fun for me. So I don't I, I'm not thinking that she was necessarily the youngest in her family back then. I think that probably came later if you're connecting the dots, as I'm thinking. I hadn't thought about that kind of thing recently. And, for example, now I'm writing the part because my book three is out at the publisher going to get published. But they told me it's going to take 325 working days, which I say to my husband, I hope I live that long. But anyway, that being said, um in my book four, she, and we did this also. It's based on what we did. She's opening, wants to open a restaurant. So what did we do? We made up menus. We put out ketchup and mustard on the tables, glasses of water. And then her brother goes, where are you going to get the food? And we were like, oh, I hadn't thought about that. So, you know, she does a kind of funny thing, but things that a kid would, or at least we did. So. it is isn't it it's, it's it's interesting how we develop these characters and stories and know. you know agree yeah so, that's one thing i can do i could give you a lit a laundry list of things i am not good at sewing baking cooking knitting any of the home arts but i i am good at writing stories it's one thing i can do no but that's nice though it's nice that you thanks one of the best things in the world i think for anybody is recognizing what you're good at and then channeling that. Uh, you're right you're right you know yes and wh yes. whenever whenever i get to talk to people which i'm lucky enough to do and mm -hmm. it's, it's one of the reasons i like it because when you talk to somebody to someone about what they're passionate about it, it just it, it kind of invigorates you as an individual, as a person. Mm. 
It's no, you're selfish, so right. Really. To... Oh, uh, 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 you know, it all depends. It all depends how you look at these things. Is it selfish? Uh, if you want to look at it that way, but I, I think it's actually pretty helpful. I know, like, I love giving gifts because it makes or give to charities, donating because that makes me feel good. So I, I, I understand what you're saying. Yeah, that is kind. Of, what one of? Oh, one of the kids recently students when i spoke to it was a third grade class which is a little bit my target age for my books is mostly fourth and fifth grade they seem to but these kids were wonderful and one of them because i leave time for questions at the end she said can you get your uh, there's always some that there are always some who want to become authors which is wonderful and one asked can you get your stories from your dreams i said yes like Robert Louis Stevenson, you know, he kept a pad and pencil. Now it would be a little yeah. laptop yeah, by yeah, his yeah. desk. Yeah, I remember that. By his bed, rather. Yeah. And when he woke up, he would write everything down. So that's a great, if you can remember them before they fly away, that's a, that's wonderful. Yeah, because that, that's um, something that the, I, I don't know, I didn't realize that was who'd come up with it, but that's something they say, isn't it? If you want to know what you're dreaming about and what your dreams mean, you should keep a notepad by your bed, and as soon as you wake up in the morning, just write it down while it's all fresh, without questioning it. You have to write it down right away. True, yeah. true, true. And 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 with, and withdraw from that moment where you might try to figure it out or judge it, and just actually write it out as as it is and as it happened. And they say that after a, I've never tried it, so I don't know, but they say after a period of time. <laughs> you get better and better at it and you you start to be able to pull details and meanings out of the actual dreams so interesting yeah i'm only an amateur psychologist but i i would say that would be pretty accurate so interesting yeah i don't i I'll don't have to have a jelly bean have a weird have a funny dream yeah well because i remember some I, d I don't remember where i learned this so my apologies uh if i'm stealing uh -huh. this from somewhere um, I remember somebody saying to me that when you, if you dream of a person, mm -hmm. try to think of what that person is to you or means to you. Uh -huh. Oh, interesting. Because it might good, often, bad, or indifferent. Yeah. So, like you know, because sometimes you have a very strange person um, in your dream that that you Ooh. think well that doesn't make sense, but you're like, well, what is it that person is to you, or what do you? You know what, what do you how do you view that person what do they mean to you what do you feel about them and that might give you an insight into the message that your subconscious is trying to tell you interest yeah probably i never really thought about it that way but that's kind of a good point because sometimes you're like why is this person popping up and with this person yeah yeah i should really leave a few minutes to write that down that is a good idea more fodder for <laughs> yeah yeah so what what's the next adventure for jelly bean you know i'm so awful at writing outlines i'm not particularly good at that either but that is a really good question and i do go around thinking about that all day long well uh this is a possibility and everyone's like oh your books are going to be banned in florida oh well you know, I have to write what I think is yep. pertinent and fits in with my story. So there may be a tr transgender child in her class. That's a possibility. And, uh, of course, my husband said vis-a-vis -vis her dog, don't you dare let anything happen to him. Like, okay, okay, yeah, fine. If you, if you let something happen to the dog, we can't be friends. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, with my husband also, so I guess you could be in cahoots. But, yeah, her dog will be around for a while long. He got away in my book one, and I usually read that part to the kids, and then they have to write a prediction or a suggestion for me. And some of the moms call, used to call me afterwards and say, my kid child just wants to know what happens. <laughs> so that, don't worry, that will not be happening. I think her... Um, I think her big son, I don't want to give too many spoilers no, from my writing, from my, my outline rather so far, like as much as it, and so troublesome for me. I think the big 
brother is going to going to stay in the Marines, at least for a while, but mm. I can't have anything too terrible happening to him. Maybe PTSD, because that's such a yeah. big problem now. And um, I don't know. Now that I'm talking to you, maybe she should travel with her family to London. That's yeah, a possibility. Well, or then maybe they should travel somewhere. Well, I I'm going to ask you one last question, and I'm just going to change mm -hmm. it slightly, because the question I normally ask for people is... Mm -hmm. If you could be anywhere at any point in time, where would you be? What would you drive? And what would you be listening to on the radio? So I will ask that for Jelly oh. Bean. If Jelly Bean could go anywhere at any point in time, any place, who would be oh. driving her? Because she's not old enough to drive. So who would be driving her? What would the car be? Uh -huh. And what would be on the radio? Okay, so that's an interesting question. Off the top of my head, and by the way, you can read more about me and my writing and my books in amypollock.com. Yep. And that's my website. Okay, I would say she would have to be driving with her friend Brittany, who she loves, and Brittany's family, which is her mom and older sister, in some old rattle trap, because that's so far where she's happiest. She's like, her tastes are kind of simple. And they would probably be listening to some lively music. This will become dated eventually. Maybe some Taylor Swift, who my eight-year-old granddaughter loves. <laughs> something like that. And they would be rocking and they'd be singing. And and Britney's mom is really, she's just, she's had to do a lot on her own. She's a survivor because the their marriage didn't work out and her dad's not a good guy and that's all in there again handled for a child that age yeah. i don't put anything you know too 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 upsetting about it but i think that's how she would she would love being reunited with brit huh. oh funny Brittany. <laughs> yeah. with a brit no that's funny yeah. that's her name no pun intended no, it's funny. That's a perfect place to stop. Thank you very, very much. Okay. I appreciate your time. Well, thank you, David. It's been fun. Take care. Take care.